Thank you, Amber. And I, I would have to say that um, um, while I'm not certainly an expert in Hong Kong, it seems to me that you are really leading the way uh, with this uh, opportunity to renovate a very large, significant uh, building within the center of, uh, of the city. And um, I think it really is through this type of intervention that we will, we will be able to kind of uh, work towards uh, our uh, goals of uh, more sustainable communities that use less energy. So speaking of uh, communities, we're going to move now from um, the building uh, scale really to the community scale and uh, uh, large communities indeed at that. We're going to really focus now on, on two major European cities uh, and really talk about how cities are matching um, the uh, intentions and interventions with available resources and the local needs. So how do we, how do we kind of bring together the, the needs with the resources so they can really move uh, projects forward. So um, I'd like to really welcome now uh, Mr. Martin Powell from London. He's the uh, mayor's ad advisor on the environment, a very important job, um, and uh, really leading, uh, leading uh, London forward into the, into the future. So he's gonna be talking about an aggregate approach, aggregating building interventions for the economy of scale. So uh, welcome. Welcome, Martin. Just while this is being set up, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to say David Miller was absolutely right this morning. Uh, reducing energy consumption and optimizing supply it creates jobs. It improves the air quality in your city, which solves a whole host of other city issues. Um, <laughs> I'm not Cornelia. Uh, um, it reduces unemployment. It generates huge city investment. No. <laughs> And um, it actually stops people dying in a cold winter, which is a very interesting statement because we all talk about the impacts of climate change, but actually poor energy efficiency, a very expensive energy supply, people cannot afford to heat their homes. Don't worry, I cheer up as I progress. Okay. Great. So there's a lot we can share without a doubt, but... Each city needs to find its own way to engage people. So I will talk about how we aggregate our programs and deliver at scale in London. But each city has to do it differently. And I'm going to illustrate that by showing you Rome. Okay, this is Pope Sixtus VI, a very famous pope in Rome, who threw into the city six obelisks. Okay, placed them in the city where he liked. And this is Rome today, and I'm sure you can see that it has perfectly followed this template. Okay, the six obelisks beautifully aligned in the city. And after the Great Fire of London, we had almost an identical plan. And this is what we built. Okay. So, cities do behave differently. We have to find our own obelisks in order to develop our cities. So, winning the Olympics is definitely one obelisk. London has an opportunity to capitalize on the Olympic Games, not just making the games themselves sustainable green, but making sure the legacy is sustainable, making sure that we develop a piece of city where people can live on and thrive in. But not only that, it's replicating the good practices we do here across the city. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to leapfrog in our sustainability standards. This is the park. This is it already in legacy, being designed now before the games have even started. Open parks, greater biodiversity, more open space, full connectivity to the internet in these open spaces, okay? Creating pieces of city where people can thrive. Not only that, we have to ensure that we stitch the Olympic Games Park into the wider community so that we can build new communities here that don't need to get into their cars to travel into the center of the city. We need to create a piece of city with employment wrapped around it. So London's ambitions are high. We have a 60% carbon reduction target by 2025. Okay, that's higher than the national profile. And in our recently published energy strategy, we have shown we can do that without any change in legislation. Okay, so this is fundamental. We have no excuse to fail, which is extremely unfortunate for somebody like me, because I will be blamed if we don't get there. 
couple of the key programs on the energy efficiency side. We have a homes energy efficiency program where we're looking to retrofit 1.2 million London homes by, by 2015. So it's just five year ambition, 1.2 million homes, which is about a third of our building stock. And we're doing this by engaging with the home occupiers through very simple means, taking the difficulty of doing this out of their hands and doing it for them. And by doing it at scale, you can bring the cost down significantly. One of the very innovative things that we've done in London is we've approached the schools recently and we've asked them to send their school children home with leaflets. And they've done this for two reasons. One is the school children tend to pester their parents and let them understand exactly what it is we want to do. And the second reason is school children are extremely cheap. Okay? This is bringing the cost down even further. Okay? So this is the key when you scale programs, you have to find a way of keeping the cost down to an absolute minimum. On top of that, obviously, uh, it's a very similar problem here in Hong Kong with, with uh, our building stock is the problem is that we cool our buildings significantly, which is very energy uh, intensive. We have um, three programs designed to deal with this, one for our public buildings, one for commercial buildings, and one for big iconic buildings that we can help showcase others in the city and pester them to do it as well. And the reason we do this is these are all their own obelisks. These are our ways of finding a means of interacting with the key stakeholders that have to engage with these programs. Our public sector buildings refit program puts a whole series of uh, uh, buildings through a framework and makes sure that the people that do the work have to guarantee the energy savings before they even start. Okay? The tender process is about them guaranteeing the energy savings and they have to underwrite that. So if the energy savings aren't delivered at the end, the contractor has to come back and replace those assets. Okay? It's at their risk. And this is a fundamental shift in the thinking of how we performance contract. On top of that, we've developed some low carbon zones across the city where we're trying to do this on a spatial basis. We have our Green 500 program, which the mayor comes and offers awards twice a year to the best performers for our commercial buildings. And we also have a Better Buildings partnership, very similar to the Toronto model, where we bring the, the city's biggest property developers together and get them to solve the problem of the tenant-landlord relationship with uh, products such as green leases and other ways of ensuring that whether you're a property owner or a tenant, that the building is retrofitted and greened. We've heat mapped the city, which is terrific. This is now helping us explore opportunities in our waste industry. We need to exploit as much of our waste potential in terms of our, its economic potential as possible. We figure we can get 20% of our waste converted to energy, which will help solve the energy supply gap created as we try and produce more and more electric vehicles into our city. So all of these things need to be balanced on a city scale. This website was so successful, it crashed within an hour of its launch. That's how good it was. I've talked about waste potential. We have to convert our waste. The economic potential is absolutely key. This 20%, this reduction in our energy use, will create the supply potential for us to have 100,000 electric vehicles in our city as soon as possible. That's our ambition. On top of that, obviously, we have to think about modal shift, getting more people out of cars is a good thing. So while an electric vehicle or a hydrogen vehicle is far uh, lower in terms of its carbon emissions and certainly in its uh, tailpipe emissions, uh, bicycles are even better again. Okay? So we've launched a bike hire scheme across London. And of course, we have to green our buses, our cabs, and we have to put the street infrastructure in place. And obviously, there is another room that's talking about electric vehicles, but this is a big part of a city solution. If we don't do the greening of our buildings sufficiently well, we won't have the, the supply fast enough to supply the electricity for the vehicles. Uh, we're tree planting. Now, you're probably wondering why on earth that has any relevance to energy efficiency. And there are two reasons, actually. One is this, this is what captures the public's imagination, planting trees and cleaning up litter. Okay? Unfortunately, energy efficiency and energy supply are not sexy enough for people to get interested in. So we have to plant some trees in order to then tell the story of all the good work we're doing around energy efficiency. This is a tremendous graph. This was created to show how can you grow the economy 
but also reduce carbon emissions, okay? So that you can always find a business case for, for doing these things. And the only question I asked myself was what was the bit in yellow? And this is the potential in most cities for energy efficiency of their building stock, domestic, commercial, public, okay? It creates by far the most jobs and green jobs as part of a new low carbon economy. Gross value added by far over 50% uh, of the GVA that will be added into the low carbon economy will th be through retrofitting of, of properties. And in terms of investment into the city, huge, okay? All of the money goes into this. So what's our next big obelisk? How do we make this stick into a city? Well, this is our financial center in 1986, kind of very flat area, and the top left is our Olympic Park. Okay, in 2006, you can see our financial center was pretty much created over that last 20 years. And by 2012, the yellow blob in the top left is the uh, Olympic Park, which uh, I'm really hoping is finished by then, otherwise it'll be extremely embarrassing for London. Okay. And then in 2026, this is the intensity of development that will take place in this area. So what we've done, rather than just look at the Olympic Park, we're taking a bigger piece of the city and we've developed a green development path, okay? So rather than talk about the low carbon economy, we've tried to create a process in order to arrive at, at the low carbon economy by following a green development model that will ensure that every new development Every retrofitted development, every new piece of city that develops, develops in a way that is suitable for the future and is going to enable us to meet our targets. And if you look at it from the top, we're putting in a district heating network that connects our waste heat to our Olympic Park and all of those developments in between. We've designated this area Green Enterprise District because branding an area is actually a very positive way of getting businesses to engage with the potential into these areas. Okay? And if you overlay our green grid, green space programs, you can see that we're not just developing a green future, we're developing a piece of city where people can thrive. We're trying to create a picture of the future today so that the rest of London can then copy this blueprint for their development. We're also building a cable car to connect two sides of the river, and I've even added it to transport for London's tube map when they weren't looking. So if you see it on the tube map, don't try and take the cable car, it's not there yet. And Siemens have very kindly invested 35 million pounds on a new visitor attraction that will be ready before the Olympics in this area as well, okay? This is a big factor in bringing out people into this area where they can live in a green way, they can do business in a green way, and they can learn and understand what the future looks like in terms of technology. And the final challenge, very simple. This is Tessa, Jacob, and Albert. These are my children, and my chickens, Daphne and Josephine. Okay, and uh, this looks a very staged picture. This is because this is an experiment on my part to show you what 80 liters of water looks like, which is our zero carbon definition for water. And once you visualize it, you can actually learn to understand it and control it and manage it in new developments and retrofit to ensure that we minimize our water usage. And with the new smart meters coming out, the smart grid, smart technology, we can now begin to visualize energy in exactly the same way. Once you can picture it, you can understand it, you can start controlling it. And that is how we're going to make sure we can retrofit both our energy supply and our building stock, which is by far the biggest creator of our carbon emissions. Thank you very much.